combine small town roots with business savvy and you've got the Rural Rundown podcast. We're sharing our marketing and branding strategies, tips and tricks that rural businesses can use to educate, inspire and entertain their customers and to help you make sales and hit profit goals. So what does it take to go from your mom is your only fan to famous in a small town? Tune in and listen up as we feature business owners and organizations that are doing big things in their community and creating opportunities for generations to come. Hey guys, here is another episode of the Rural Rundown podcast uh, with Rach and Prenna and Oli. I've traveled really far today for today's episode to be here with our guests <laughs> down the hall. Uh, so yeah, we have my boyfriend Oli on the podcast today, the owner of Oli's Images, to talk to us about systems and processes. But before we dive in, checking in, Rach, how are things in your neck of the woods? Yeah, things are moving along. As we record this, yes, or it's February 15th. So yesterday was Valentine's Day. The day before was the Super Bowl. I have to ask you guys, did you have a stake in the game on who won? Or did no. you did you watch? Yes. Yeah. We didn't really have a stake in the game. Um only like, I don't know, not to speak for you, but you're not really too into football. <laughs> I like, you know, I'm a diehard for the Packers. So the I don't know you know like the Rams and the Bengals are just kind of (laughs) weird teams to even make it to the Super Bowl in my opinion (laughs) Uh, that's how I felt too and somebody was telling me that their friend was like a really big Bengals fan and I'm like I've never heard of anybody being a Bengals fan before but I mean that's just where we're from I feel like everybody's Packers or Vikings maybe Chiefs you know like you don't go too far out so yeah that was funny yeah. But did you watch the commercials? Did you have a stake in any of the commercials? Um, to be honest, there was lots of little kids running around, so I didn't really get to see the commercials, but I did watch the halftime show, which was fun. And I smiled the whole time. What about you? What are your thoughts on that commercials? Everything. I had, I had a lot of thoughts. One that we keep talking about is the Coinbase commercial, which had the QR code just bouncing, like the old uh, DVD logo, if you remember, like watching that mm-hmm. bounce around the TV. And then at the end of the commercial, if, if anybody hasn't seen that, uh, it flickers kind of like a VCR, like tape would do at the end, you know, like a VHS tap tape would like flicker and go to a blue screen the whole time the QR code was up I was freaking out and I'm like are you kidding me like that's what this is the whole commercial like you spend upwards you know people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these commercials and pay for advertising and you spent it on a QR code that changes colors on a black screen like That was insane. So Oli scanned it. I didn't grab my phone fast enough because I think I was still just shocked that that's what they spent their marketing budget on. But it was so good. And we've been talking about it because that's something that we've been pushing both of our clients to include on business cards and in marketing materials, especially like stallion flyers and ads to use QR codes. And people have been hesitant or unsure because it's just kind of a big blocky element to add to a design but it's so useful and I all I could stop like or all I could think about was like I hope people see how useful this is like somebody spent their Super Bowl advertising budget on a QR code that's it yeah I love that QR codes have had like a comeback. I never expected to see that. And now they are like relevant again and it's entertaining. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I don't, I don't remember if we've talked about this on the podcast before, but through the pandemic, if people were going out to restaurants and stuff, transitioning from paperless menus or being able to look at stuff on your phone, a lot of people have become used to using QR codes. Now they know what they are and where it kind of directs them. So yeah it's become a form of advertising that is is really simple to execute and is so useful and purposeful uh to directing people you know for a long time I feel like we went through that period of being like you can include your website or your phone number or your social media handles on print advertising but who's taking the time to like get it out and type in www dot blah 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 so as designers we saw that transition to maybe not including entire websites just directing people to certain places um 
But now we have QR codes, people can scan right from their phones and be directed you know, anywhere. So I, I think it's a, a huge deal when you're talking about marketing and something that, like I said, is so simple and easy to execute. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you use them? Do you guys have a preference or recommendation for like small businesses who are like, oh, I should maybe add that to my business card. Like, is there a QR generator or something you like to use? Do you have anything to say on that? Yeah. So if you guys remember back through the pandemic too, there was a short time where if you have an iPhone, uh, all these like shortcuts and changing out your app icons became really popular. Do you remember that at all, Rach? Yeah. Yeah. And it was like this whole aesthetic thing. Well, um, Apple has a shortcut code or a shortcut um, process, I guess, that generates QR codes. So I use it on my phone. Um, and it's just in your shortcuts button on your phone. You can go in, you can find that shortcut. So I have it set up so it pops up and I enter the address that I want it to go to, and it'll just process a QR code for free. Um, there are other QR code generators you can find online be careful because a lot of them are paid stuff. Like it'll act like it's free, but then it all of a sudden will be like, oh, your 30 day trial. Yep. Yeah. And then you're left with like, shoot, I just printed out 500 business cards or whatever. Now you're worried about your QR code generating. Um, so there's those. The other thing I just uh, learned the other day is that InDesign, the Adobe uh, program that people use to design stuff, InDesign has a QR code generator inside of it. So when you're designing stuff, you can just pop, you know, you just go into your like settings, generate QR code, and you put in the hyperlink. So I just tried it like 10 minutes ago on Illustrator because I was designing business cards for a client and it's not there in Illustrator yet, which is I think silly about Adobe programs that they don't have stuff throughout all of their programs. But I think hopefully that's something they'll be adding through Photoshop and Illustrator that you can go in and just generate QR codes. Cool. Yeah, I knew about like the paid ones and that's about it. So I learned something too, just from the <laughs> quick little chat. Yeah, Oli, Oli doesn't have the shortcut on his phone. So he's always like with clients, he's like, can you uh, give me a QR code to this? <laughs> like sure i'll get one real quick so i didn't on the last one yeah. i know i did business cards for a client and they wanted all their contact info on there which is too much for a little business card so i put like the necessary stuff name phone number whatever uh but i put all of their information in a qr code people can scan it hit it it goes right into their contacts so they can people don't have to like type in all of the stuff into a contact and sit there forever it's just super quick one or two clicks of a button or touches on the screen and all of their contact info went over there right into their phones like they saved them yeah, yeah oh, that's right so cool yeah. that'd be really helpful too i feel like for a lot of people i love um this is i hope i'm not getting way too off track but what sometimes now when you know if you text it into like text marketing they'll send you like their contact to save right from like a simple click and i think that's so smart too because sometimes you opt into things and then you're like what's this number yeah, but right. if you have the option to save it, it's like, I don't know, it's more friendly when you see it coming across your screen instead of like six, seven, eight, nine, two, zero. Yeah. So. Yeah. Like I've even saved like Facebook and Spotify or all those other platforms that want to send you like the dual like authentication or whatever. I've saved those as contacts too. Cause I'm like, it's so frustrating if I'm looking for something and I can't see what it is. Cause it's just a bunch of numbers. So I think that's cool too, with the text marketing, if you have that option, if you're using text marketing, cause we've talked about that on the podcast before too, to have an option where people can save your contact or to share your contact directly. We not to like get on the tangent of contacts, but we harp on this a lot with um, like Oli's parents and other clients who share information back and forth. Um, and Oli's been caught doing it to me too. But when you save information in contacts, like all of that switches over. So when, when I was working for Oli's images, I saved like all of my contact information and I saved like my company um, website. Like I have my personal website, but then my company website as Oli's images as well, because I was like that front desk person at the booth a lot. 
But if somebody were to add me as a contact or my contact ever got shared, it links to all these images as well. So like, that's just like housekeeping things to do for yourself too. like go into your contact on your phone and make sure that your contact card is like up to date, has a professional looking picture, especially if you're messaging people for business and then that it includes your email and your website, because those are important things that as your friends share your contact card, all of that stuff gets sent to new clients. So be careful what you're putting in there. Yeah, that's smart. That's a good tip. Hot tip, hot take. Yeah, yeah. Oli shared my contact with a client and I had a nickname uh, because he thought it was funny that Siri in his car, when he would talk to her, would call, it calls people by their nicknames rather than like their name on the contact card. But that transferred over to our client too. So her Siri now also says that nickname. You oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> it's a learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, I, as we kind of move on to this, Oli, I want you just to kind of share your background, like where you grew up, where you're from, what kind of brought you into this business entrepreneurial life. I know there's a lot there. So just go ahead and launch into it and we'll ask you as, as you talk. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to, to interject or ask clarifying questions too. Like, no problem. Uh, I can start and stop anytime. So, um, basically, I'm I'm from Wyoming. I went to UW for my last two degrees. I have three. Um, but during that last my last couple of degrees there, I was interning. Um, you know, you have to have an internship for each degree as you go through programs. And so, my last degree, I, I needed an internship. So I was at Peabody Energy. I was trying to be a landman. That was like my main thing. So I saved it for last. And everybody around me at, at the courthouse was over their, over their, you know, desks or whatever. And we're all trying to take pictures of these huge courthouse documents, you know, land records, that sort of thing. And, uh, and as you flip through the pages, we had to take pictures of them. So I was over there with my iPhone hunched over you know, and like taking these pictures. And I look around, everybody else had a camera, you know, they had like a DSLR at the time. And so I thought that's what I'm going to do. So I told my parents, I'm going to save up because this is killing my back to just be hunched over all the time. And I'm going to get a DSLR because that's what everybody else is using. And if I'm going to be doing this business for, you know, any period of time, I can't live with my back being like this. Like this is, this hurts already. And I'm, you know, still young and fresh and still, and if I heard this bad now, I'm going to really hurt bad later, you know? So, um, they surprised me a month early for my birthday and gave me a Canon 70 D, which is basically an entry level or just one step up from an entry level camera. And so uh, the next day, you know, I learned everything I could that night. And then the next day I just took it to work and started shooting with it. Uh, I got to back to the office at the end of the day, just because the way things worked, I went to the courthouse first and, and then I went and checked in with my boss at the end of the day and I showed her what I did and she said, oh, I wish you wouldn't have done that. <laughs> so um, basically she didn't like that and, and she rightfully so because you couldn't read any of the stuff. Like I had no idea what I was doing. Like photography was like, I had no idea, zero clue on like what's aperture, what's shutter speed, what's all this stuff, like what does this mean? And I was taking these just awful pictures and then I still had to like process it. But my phone, it was super easy for this. It, it put them into a PDF, turned them to black and white, straighten the edges. Like my phone did a lot of stuff that I was just not appreciating because I never did it the old way. And she's like, no, don't watch those old other people. They're doing it the old hard way and we're doing it the new cutting edge way. So then I had this camera that I had no, like no way to make money with. And that's kind of, kind of my thing is like, you know, it felt expensive. It was only like 1500 bucks probably. But uh, at the time, you know, like that was like two or three weeks of pay. And that felt like a lot, right? It felt like I really had to save up to get to that point. And so I said, let's try to return it. And there's like, they laughed at me. They're like, there's no way he can return it. You know, we've, we've opened it, you've used it. So, so just go have fun with it. And that didn't really resonate with me real well. It's just like going to have fun and that's it. And so I, I was like, well, I got to find out a way to make some money with this thing and like, you know, pay them back or something. I felt bad that they bought me this thing I can't use. So they said, well, in two weeks, we have our Wrangler Classic, which is their, it's their biggest event of the year. Uh, it's a fairly large team roping, barrel race, calf roping. All we, back in the day, it was really, really big. And we had multiple, Brenna's heard a million stories about it, but um, I mean, we'd had everything from a sail barn to, to poker night and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, they have an entire golf course at their house, uh, like a full size, you know, par th three par, 
par three golf course. And, uh, and so they said, well, in two weeks, why don't you shoot the barrel race at our event? And Daryl is going to come and, and shoot the team rope and he'll show you, you know, everything you need to know. So just don't sweat it. Uh, just show up and, and we'll do it. So I showed up, Daryl did not show up. So luckily I had studied really hard. I didn't want to be the guy that just shows up not knowing anything. So I'd, I'd made a plan it, that, that, uh, camera also came with a printer. I still have a version of that printer here today. Uh, it was the pro 100, just like the entry level professional printer from Canon that does photos. And so I took my laptop and that printer and we kind of created this system where I would take a picture and after so many runs, say, say every like 25 runs or 50 runs, every, every time they did a big drag, they, I would take that card and I would bring it to my girl that I hired to like run my booth. And I had this little system and I didn't, I wasn't able to train her very good because I didn't really have any training myself. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. So <laughs> just figure it out, I guess. So I kind of like gave her the, the general, like rough idea, right? I showed her how to plug in the, the memory card and, and do that stuff and kind of roughly edit a photo and the crop it to size and print it. And so we basically uh, just started with this kind of very rough sort of like, this is the big picture thing that I want to have happen. You know, like I, I want to take pictures. I want you to show pictures. I want you to take the money. I want you to print the pictures and, uh, and then give them to the customers, right? Right then and there on the spot. And turns out not a lot of photographers do that sort of thing but i thought this is like how else are these people going to know how to get a hold of me i don't have a website yet you know i don't have hardly social media i created that in like the last like week so it was just like this whole thing i didn't even know what to call my company until that day like i had no idea what i, I didn't even have a name I didn't even have a company because nobody's buying stuff so i didn't have a company so i was just like well I'll call it all these images i guess i don't know it's feels like a temporary sort of a thing until I find a real job. Um, so I did that and I started with like this very rough kind of process. I was just shooting the one barrel and I was trying to time out my shots because, you know, like people said, like timing is everything. I have shirts now that say that. Um, but now it's like, well, now I have really good timing, but at the time I didn't. So it was really hard. So people were coming over, like my friends that were barrel racers that I, you know, kind of sort of knew uh, a couple of them were like, hey, Ole, can you, you know, like just hold the trigger down maybe? And, you know, cause like you're missing the timing here. And so I thought, yeah, sure. You know, like whatever it takes to get the job done. So I did the old spray and pray, which I don't recommend people do for a long period of time, but you know, if you, if you're missing the shots, you got to do something to get the shots. Right. So that's what I did. And then I thought, well, pretty quickly, I, I realized that I'm just sitting here watching them run around the other two barrels. And so then I started shooting them at the other two barrels and they just love that. I thought that was really cool. And, uh, and then eventually a couple, you know, weeks later, I realized, why don't I take a picture of them running home too? So I started that and it very quickly from just, you know, day one, basically I had this system where I was doing this same thing and I've carried that almost the exact same thing, but we've made it better and streamlined along the way and, and change out little things. But that same system is held true until I retired, you know, at the end of 2020. Okay, I got a couple questions for you. So starting out, like you just kind of made things keep working or kind of added to that. We're like, oh, now we should move over here. But how long did it take you to feel like you actually were in like a good system? Because I think that's something we don't talk about. We're like, we need to create systems. But it's not like you snap your fingers and they're just perfect. Can you yeah. kind of give us a an insight into that i mean this is this might be like kind of disheartening for a couple people but it kind of felt like at day one you know i was like oh actually like i didn't realize that i'd created a system you know what i mean like i didn't realize like i didn't go in there thinking i need like this specific thing and then now i've achieved it i was like well this makes sense to me this seems like the flow of events and i was like well this is actually kind of like clockwork, you know, and by the, and then, so like you got memory cards, right? And so part of the system is they got to get those memory cards back to you, right? So when that shuffles back to you, you're like, oh, this is like working fairly smoothly. Like this is kind of good. You know, you can see it working kind of right away. You know, it's like there's a beginning and then an end and then it loops back, right? And so um, as, as long as you can kind of see a system and see it, you know, from a high level, you kind of see it working, you got a system. 
Do um, how long did it take you to figure out your timing for the action shots? Because I'm curious about that. I feel like that's so hard, and I don't even do that like as a living. So, right. Um, it it did take a while, and you know, I was using that as a crutch. You know, using the spray and pray as a crutch for too long, really. Um, and that first, like, so like four months later, I had to shoot two, basically two months later, I got the gig, but then four months later, I had to shoot the WTRC finals, which is huge, uh, up in that region. Uh, they have about 6,000 team team rope in over six days. It's a big deal. And I got hired to do that and, uh, you know, got that opportunity and I was still doing the old spray and pray technique at that time. Cause I was only, you know, I'd had a camera for two months or four months, you know? So we were, we kind of like had to whittle it down a little bit pretty quickly because we shot 120,000 pictures in one week and my, on the 70 D, you know, and it's only good for 150,000 pictures and it's, it really starts to break down. So it was like, well, I can either buy a new camera every week or we got to figure out another way to do this. And you look at other bottlenecks too, that that creates, like, there's a lot of problems uh, like showing somebody up their run and there's like 30 pictures in their run. And they're like, uh, is this going to go over? Cause I got a rope again, you know? Um, and then it creates like, you know, you've got one customer there that's way too long. So getting customers in and out, you make more money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's all of these like little things that add up to say, all right, we need to get the timing down here. We got to make things happen. We got to whittle it down. So it became like, well, we still aren't really good at timing. So maybe like two or three clicks at every, at every point and maybe one of those hopefully will get it um after you you go to the same event over and over and over you know you get your timing down for that thing right like i've talked to rodeo photographers that shoot all these like weird things all the time and every day is kind of different for them and they're like i've been trying for 30 years to get this loop to come around and get that shot I'm like are you kidding me it did like i shoot that every <laughs> single time forever because i shoot just that event you know what i mean like yeah. i'll shoot all weekend for that event or or a week or i might shoot months of just that event without scheduling other events in there so having that having that consistency and shooting the same thing over and over sounds really boring but you get really good at that thing mm -hmm. and then your income just skyrockets. talk about because you've shared this before so mm -hmm. like there was the spray and pray which is which for, for people who aren't photographers is holding down your shutter and it's quick like fast photos it just releases your shutter you know however many times that your camera is is set up to do right so like could be 16 frames a second which is what your yeah. your cameras are now or it could right. be you know seven frames a second so every second you're holding down that button it's taking seven photos um so you went from the spray and pray but you had which i what i think a lot of people miss is that you it seems like often whether that was true in the beginning or not, you often look at your business and you say like, okay, what's working, what's not working? Like yeah. by the time I came into Oli's Images, it was at the end of every event. You were basically like, okay, did that event work? Did it not work? Are we going back next year? Like you were making those decisions a year in advance. Yeah. So you, um, you've, you've told me before how you look at these photos in Lightroom and you decide to like, so first of all, it was, it was the timing of the shot to get the exact shot that everybody wanted. But then you also looked in Lightroom to see what people were purchasing. So talk about that. Yeah. I think it actually, it happens in other, in different order. So basically by doing the spray and pray technique mm -hmm. and showing people pictures, all of their pictures and a lot of them, and then, you know, just slight, like a millisecond between each shot. Right um you're able to capture all these different moments in time during the same run and we're using that data we're going back and we're looking at what do people actually purchase you know people vote with their dollars and say i like this right there and if you can line up and see that like you know this loop is this loop looks like this or their hand looks like that or their horse's position looks like this and you compare all these pictures and you see a trend happening right if you go into lightroom the way we use Lightroom, we only edit people's sold pictures, right? If they bought it. So if it's in Lightroom, I know they bought it. And so I can go through Lightroom and look at hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pictures and see which ones they purchased and then start putting them into like a category. Like if we, sometimes it's easier to take Photoshop. So you have a real, like the actual photo. And then when, anytime you see one that looks just like that, same timing, same everything, you put a little hash mark under it or you, you know, count. 
So we're basically counting up all of those images that they sold at each moment in time and realizing like, okay, this, there's like a huge spike here. Like people love this shot. Like when that horse comes around second barrel and you snap that shot and their legs are planted and their back ends planted and they're coming around, they look, you know, that's the shot, then great. We know that is the classic shot. That's what everybody wants uh, because we use data to find out what people want. So we're using that a uh, very data-driven approach to everything that I do. Uh, but yeah, it's just like that. Any event that I shoot, you know, I go and shoot a couple of events and you kind of figure out the timing. You can look ahead to it. Like what are other people selling? Like go on Google, search, you know, rodeo, team roping, whatever it is. And look at, see, find consistency. If you've never shot an event before and you don't have your own data, use other people's data, you know, find out what are people showing. Go to a magazine, find out what pictures they're using in a magazine. Um, that's not always like the most accurate. The best thing is to use your own sales data and figure out what your people want and how you're capturing it in the in the way that they are just excited about. And they're, they go to your booth, they've already kind of gotten this image in mind, but they can't convey that to you necessarily uh, before you shoot. So it's like, it's one of those things where after it's all done, the dust is settled, you do the count, you find out, and then you're shooting less pictures on either side of that moment until you're shooting just that moment. And then you wait until the next moment and you shoot that. And you're just getting this, the best moment, each peak, every time there's like a huge influx of orders for that moment, then you're just chopping off and grabbing just the, that peak. I feel like for context, <laughs> I don't know if we like skipped over this part, but what you were shooting before you retired is horse and rodeo, oh. which I think hopefully people like got that. Yeah. If we yeah. like didn't skip over that too far is team roping barrels, calf roping. I know you touched on that a little bit. Um, so this is always like fast action stuff, like a calf roping yeah. run, you know, average from three to seven seconds and team roping runs are the same, you know, five to five to upwards depending yeah, on how, I mean, how it goes half rope in not five seconds but yeah 12 seconds yeah. yep so it's like you know all this stuff is happening mm -hmm. pretty fast that's how the action is happening fast too so there's the system to how you're shooting but then there's also a system to your business and how that worked too so i worked in the Oli's images system um mm -hmm. So basically what it is, is, you know, like he has to take the pictures in the arena, but then the, we're showing those pictures on site too. So there was a process of like how we show the photos and you hit on that a little bit where it's like yeah. getting people yeah. in and out fast, showing them their photos quickly. Um, but like then knowing enough about like there's so much to your business <laughs> because you would hire new employees every weekend too. So it was like yeah. the the systems and processes you had in training people because you had a short amount of time with them before you were basically like run my booth take it over like yeah. you're in charge of my business and my livelihood this weekend um so that was like a huge thing too to just see so many parts of of what you had and how it really did start from the basics of hey, here's, here's this is like yeah. what I'm going to do. And I'm going to jump in like feet first. Talk a little bit about your family and the history of like entrepreneurs that you have in your family. Cause I, I think that's so interesting that we've talked about here before is like, how do you get into the mindset of even like starting your own business? Yeah. Um, before I touch on that, I like, like you said, I got to hire new people all the time. So I want to stick with that for just a second. So your, my system and process couldn't be so complicated that I couldn't teach it in like an hour or less. Right. I would have people show up an hour before and like 30 minutes is all I got. Cause I have my own stuff to do downstairs down in the arena. Um, and I have my own systems, you know, that I have to do personally to prep for shooting the pictures. Uh, so I had like 30 minutes to teach some people or, or sometimes somebody would come like the night before. I usually try to hire my good friends so I, I could bait them into coming over the night before, you know, and hanging out, um, try to teach them, you know, a rough system and kind of help them along the way and then kind of leave it open to them for interpretation too a little bit because, you know, they got good ideas too. Like I'm not the only, you know, evil genius here. So, you know, a lot of times I said, Brenna, if you think of something right, yeah. that's better try it, you know, just go for it and try it and let me know what the results are. Because like, I can't down there. I don't know. You right. know what I mean? Like who knows what's going on up in the booth? I'm, I'm so far away. And you, if I just tried to conceptualize it in my mind, I might think, no, that's not going to work, but why don't we just try it and see, and if people resonate with it, then great. If it works for the crowd, if it's better for people, 
awesome. Let's just keep, let's plug that into my system and go. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so that system can't be too complicated, basically the gist of it, unless you hire a long-term employee like Florida. Yeah, but even like my very first day at Oli's Images was in Rapid City, South Dakota <laughs> at a team roping. And it was like, I showed up the day before, but I was working a couple of jobs. Like I didn't have a ton of time either. And so it was like a very basic, like, here's how the system is set up. Like, this is where the booth is. This is where I'll be shooting. Like, here's how it kind of works. Like a very quick, like down and dirty thing of like, I'm going to take the pictures. You need to get the card. Then you need to like put the pictures on the computer, show the pictures, sell the pictures, bring the card back to me. And the whole thing starts all over. Um, but the process, like the running the booth managing thing was like a maybe 20 minute, like yeah. here's how all of this stuff works. All of the, the inside details of that simplified process. And he's like, now you're on your own. And like, mm -hmm. maybe my mom will show up at noon. Maybe she'll show up at six. Yeah. And so that's kind of like how it worked, but yeah, having somebody who who knew a little bit about, you know, what was going on. I knew the smallest bit about working Lightroom. I knew how to run a computer really well. Like, you know how to do all of that stuff. Um, file and, structure. Yeah, file structure. And I like knew, I knew the sport a little bit. Like I knew the sport a very small amount compared to like what I know now. I was like, wow. Like I knew what team roping was. I knew how it worked. I knew the basis of it, but now I feel like I know <laughs> yeah. all of the things because right. that's what helped me like be good in the system to like be a good part of it. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of it is kind of like trial by fire. I feel like with your, with your employees too, right. Where it was <laughs> like, there was even plenty of people that the time I was there, like had hired for the day. And it was like, okay yeah, you that's you don't have to come back tomorrow it's okay like that just didn't yeah. work out for us so that was a a really interesting way to see like the hiring process and like what you have going on because because we weren't always shooting in the same location we were traveling full-time mm -hmm. that it's like you can't invest for somebody to to come back okay like we'll try again next weekend or we'll try whatever it's like you have three days to to work and then we're not going to be back for another year maybe um so that person was either like do or die quickly mm -hmm. like they were going to work in your business and in your system or they weren't going to work yeah so that was interesting yeah sink or swim yeah sounds like it <laughs> yeah. and, i mean generally i don't shoot one day events you know yeah. because they're they're too small they're just not profitable um I don't care who you are, right? Like there are very few one day events are profitable. And at the end of my career, there's no way that one day it would be profitable enough for, for me yeah. to sacrifice a whole weekend for, you know, if it's just like a Saturday, you know, uh, my events usually start on Friday, ended on Sunday, you know, for like the core, most of the groups. Uh, some events though would be a week long. Some would be three weeks long and we'd be at the same place over and over for a long period of time. Um, you know, so some of those long ones, it was hard to find people that didn't have a real job, you know, that they were committed to going there every day and they could take three weeks off from whatever they were doing to help me, yep. you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of struggles to a lot of hard finding stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk about your family's history and running businesses, because I think, I think that's important to note too, about how you approached systems because I think you saw from a really young age, even at, at Red and Dyes, that like how businesses work and how like you need to have systems inside of a business. Yeah. I mean, you like any business, you know, you need to have something to sell. So like at Moss Sales Boots and Tack, they had which saddles, is your grandparents. Yeah, Explain which is, this. Oh, talk yeah. about this. So which is my my grandparents started Moss Saddles Boots and Tack and they had a trailer sales business right next door. And my, you know, my grandpa Red was a car salesman before that, you know, and so he started, he started this business, Moss House Boots and Tack. It was kind of like the hangout. They had a little stove, they had coffee on all the time, you know, customers come in forever. And so they, they had inventory, right? And that would come in and out and in and out. And you have to replenish that inventory, just like I have to replenish photos. I have to keep taking photos. So I have new photos to sell. Um, they had to keep buying new inventory, right? So it's the same thing. They had a cashier at the front, right? So people would go through, 
you know, and somebody was like in the store to help them, you know, shop, help them fit a saddle, help them, you know, try on boots or whatever. Right. And so that's how, like, I kind of, I didn't model it necessarily after them. In my mind, I was thinking about Walmart a lot when I was <laughs> doing all these images stuff, but basically the same concept, right? It was like they, you've got a cashier at the front and you, you've got to check out and then they can bag it for you and then they can send you on your way. And so that's what we do. We take pictures, we show pictures, we take their order, we take their money and then we bag it up and then they can carry on with their life. Um, my parents have the Wrangler Horse and Rodeo News and it's a you know fairly big newspaper in the Wyoming and the surrounding states. Um, but yeah, same, same sort of thing. You know, they, they need advertisers they need stories they need they need content to sell they have sales people that sell ads and that kind of thing uh they have a printer and a you know publishing and there's a system and a process there too right uh we used to have to they used to print them locally there in riverton we'd go pick them up from the print shop like when i was a little kid you know and then we would stuff the if there's an insert we'd stuff it all and we'd uh, wrap it up and put rubber bands on it. I don't know. There's a lot of like weird things that happen, but you know, little labels and then they had to go in these sacks and those sacks got sent off to the post office. And, and then that just happened every, you know, they ship out twice a month. And so every other week or whatever, it's just a endless thing, an endless cycle that just build and build and build. And each time, you know, you get a little bit better at it. You know, you say, well, what if we tried this thing, right? Like what if we, you know, did this instead of that? And, you try out little things or you find a bottleneck, you know, if you like Brennan and I started playing this game and you can see a bottleneck as it goes through the system. <laughs> uh, but it's basically like that. Like if there's a holdup and there's like all of your orders, or like at all these images, if we saw a stack of orders piling up and the, the person that's editing the photos and printing them isn't keeping up with the, the demand that the pile's getting bigger and this pile of photos isn't keeping up, right? It isn't equaling out. Well, then there's a bottleneck there somewhere. And so what are we doing? What can we fix in the system? What's the holdup? What, like, is it, is it Lightroom? Is it something that we're not doing? So I, you know, I teach people like sync the photos or do more at one time. Or then I bought a second printer and said, well, maybe we're waiting on the printer, right? Because like everything is here. And then now the bottleneck's at the printer, right? We have, we have a smooth system up until that. So I bought another printer. Then we can send an order to each printer or we can split an order in half and send a little bit to each printer, whatever it takes. If we need three printers, great. If we got a lot of demand, no problem. Um, you know, so we can take this same, the same approach too, and we can just duplicate it. So when I had a bigger event and I needed two booths or three booths, I just bought another booth and bought all the same things that were in the booth, all the TVs, the notebooks, down to the tablecloth, whatever. I just duplicated it verbatim. And then hired another person or hired multiple yeah. people to fill it up and it just expands or contracts based on how big or small the event is that i'm shooting if i need three booths great no problem we just triplicate everything and in 2020 i think that was so apparent too that like we could go from one to the other like 2020 we shot um the the bfi and we shot the patriot where you yeah. hired what 15 or 20 yeah, employees 15, yeah. yeah 15 employees at one event and then we also did the dash and dance in south dakota which i was gone for so yeah. we set up one tv at a self-help station there was no employees so it was it was crazy that you could scale that big in a business mm -hmm. and still make money um and and relatively do the same exact system the whole yeah. time you know it, it was the same thing yeah it's always profitable it doesn't matter what size of the event is uh because you're just reducing your overhead until you're profitable yeah dude is this something that like has always been <laughs> like within you to be like data driven. I mean, I feel like, um, and to see those things. Cause I feel like some people like live in a different world where they would never even think about the bottlenecks or think about that stuff. Like, can you tell me about that? Or is there something that triggered you to be like, no, I know I need to do this better. I'm curious. Yeah. So like, I've always, I've always liked science and math and, and that kind of thing and resonated with that really well and, and art, right. And photography is where those two meet. Mm -hmm. and then bring in business and it just explodes right like if you can if you can make the science work as art and then you can sell that at a high volume for business like you're making some money now right and so that like I've always been like a little bit money driven and a little bit like creative driven 
And so I'm able to combine those two into photography. And uh, like my first degree is in business and one of my other degrees is as a scientist. And so, you know, I kind of mush those two together and through photography and, you know, like it's just this mix that just works. And as you're just going through things and you're seeing that bottleneck, you see that like, well, we got to do something about this. You know, we can't just, I can't just let it sit and just become this thing that we deal with. Right. Um, we have to work through that problem and smooth it all out. And that it just, it's born out of necessity more than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think like from an outsider's perspective, uh, like just how the people you were surrounded with when you grew up, right? Like, like your grandparents and, and seeing that business work and then with the Wrangler too, like you were exposed to so many different things that came in handy, like later on, like when you, because I had never met somebody before who was, was into the, the rodeo scene, but also knew so much about like the creative or like the design side of things. And that came from like the Wrangler, like you had seen for so long, like what images make the cover, what images people like talk about and what gets published, like all of that. i feel like from an outside perspective, like all of that had to help you like later on but and stuff that like you as a kid, like you never paid attention to, like it wasn't your drive to take over the Wrangler still isn't much yeah. to my dismay. Uh, but you, because you went, you were going to school to be a landman, you're going to school to work in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And then you made this transition to like, hmm, well, I like this. And you always say like, you run a business, it just happens to be photography. Like right. the photos don't come first. It's the business that comes first, which I think is like what you mentioned, Rach, why that's such a, it's so different than most creative business owners we see to, to be data driven because you're looking at it as a business always. And just mm -hmm. like photography is second. Yeah. Like I'm not making images for myself. I'm right. making images to sell. The images I make for myself are like, we go out in the desert and nobody sees that stuff. I might post it on like my third social media account that never yeah. gets any attention. But if I'm doing creative things for me, like nobody sees that stuff. But basically all of this, I'm thinking about the customer, like thinking about like, what do they want? What does the customer like already have in mind? How can I meet them where they're at? Like, we're always trying to get to the point where we're getting instant gratification. So the closer we can get to instant gratification, that's what I like, that's what I've realized my customers want, you know, is like faster, faster, faster. It's the world we live in. So printing on site, like you get real close to instant gratification. They could rope. They could go up to the booth and look at a picture, say, that's the one. We could print it out 30 seconds later if there's none ahead of them, right? If there's no orders ahead, we're like 30 seconds. Like, just wait, don't go anywhere. Well, here yeah. you go, right? So it's just all of this stuff. Like, even, even down to the, the bags that we put photos in at the very end of it is super important because I used to put them in a manila envelope. Nobody knows what a manila envelope is when people are... All of a sudden, there's like all these people walking around with manila envelopes, and they're all just like, what is that? And they're confused, right? And when you confuse, you lose. We've read that in business books. Yeah. Um, but what I did is I realized nobody knows what these manila envelopes are. Let's get clear bags that sparkle in the light, right? So you put a, that in there. Somebody sees it's a photo. They see that's from today. There's a photographer here printing on site today. I want my photos now. Yeah. I don't want to wait. I don't want to ship my photos. I don't want to wait two weeks to go look at them on their website. These people forget about what happened two weeks ago. I forget about what happened two weeks ago. So if we can get them instant gratification and then they're taking that around, snowball. All of a sudden there's like a zombie apocalypse. Everybody's like the booth, the place to be. Like, it's crazy. Like I've gone over there or I've seen from the distance, you know, cause I'm shooting at the other end of the arena. And the booth is happening, like everybody's laughing, there's lights going off, there's people just like, just crowds of people around because we show on 50 inch TVs. So the whole crowd can see the line waiting behind your family, your friends, everybody can see what's going on. Everybody can see you get thrown in the dirt, whatever it is, you know, they're laughing, they're having a good time and they're spending money. Yeah. So I just want, I'm curious, you said this was kind of like a new way to do it or had you seen other photographers do that in a different way like tell me about that yeah so like when when I grew when I was growing up you know like Daryl that was supposed to come help me um unfortunately he's not with us anymore but he he was selling them out of like his 
slide in camper on his mm-hmm. truck and they had like this little dinky printer you know just a home job at the time I thought well that's pretty cool that he can take a picture and print it here and he always had just like a line at his booth and he was making a lot of money with photography too so I, I always thought like that's how everybody does it you know mm-hmm. uh, but then once you get out into like the world and you're starting to figure out you know you look around like I just never looked at what other photographers are doing I looked at what Daryl did I thought that's kind of like what I should do, but better because I'm not printing on this little like inkjet printer yeah. from a desktop, you know? And, and so I just wanted to have new cutting edge way of doing what he was doing forever. And so I thought that's just what everybody does. And, you know, pretty soon after, you know, maybe six months or something of doing it, everybody was coming to me like, wow, you print on site. Like, this is cool. Like I've never seen this before. I was like, I haven't seen this since I was a little kid. Are you kidding me? Like, this is not new, uh, but it it feels new to them because they've never seen it before. Their local photographer doesn't do it. You know, a lot of photographers want to be the lone wolf. They want to be the solo guy that does everything. They think that because they they have their little website set up and their little social media account, and they're not making a ton of money with that, that they can't afford help. But it comes in reverse. Like, you can't afford not to have help (laughs) if you you know you you don't have this good system in place you don't have a system at all and you're trying to like sell people pictures from two weeks ago that you just finally got up on your website you know because like people want to like photographers being a lone wolf they got like this ego like invested into it right and so they're saying i don't want anybody to see my messed up shots i don't want anybody to see unedited pictures you know they they just have like this mentality of like it has to be perfect before anybody sees it yeah. like your customers don't care like they, they're worried about weird little facial expressions that they're doing yeah. they or have what no their idea. course looks like yeah. like yeah uh, it's all about thinking about them just like we're thinking about us and so if you can realize that like they're not thinking about you they're thinking about them then all of a sudden you're like get them their pictures as fast as they can and then i'll edit just the ones that they want to buy whatever and then that kind of like satisfies my ego a little bit and we try to make them look as good as possible in camera and with strobes we can well, there's very little editing anyway, but you know, we're just like everything builds upon everything else, yeah. right? Just making the system work. Yeah. Well, and I think it's interesting because what you ended up doing is you made an experience for your customers, which brought them like made it a big deal for mm-hmm. everybody because then they were probably like, look at this photo I got. I just got it printed. I mean, like you yeah. did reverse engineer it to make it about them instead of like about you. Yeah, what I'm doing, which I think that is hard to do sometimes when you're like, I'm the business owner, I'm so invested in what I do. But like you said, like, nobody cares, like they want what, (laughs) what they want. And that's it, you know, so that's really cool. Yeah, like nobody wants to buy a drill bit, right? Like they want to buy, they want a hole in a piece of wood, right? So if you're, if you can figure out how to make that hole in that piece of wood easier, you know, faster, better, whatever, like they'll buy your drill bit. But you don't like they're not buying like your drill bit because it has a diamond bit on it. And they're like, oh, my God, look at this drill bit I bought. They're like, look, I put a piece of hole in this wood. So just think about your customers and how they're like what they want, like what they already are coming in for and just meet them where they're at. And same thing with technology, you know, like everybody wants to force them go to my website. I'm like, well, or come to my booth and we'll I hire somebody to do the whole thing for you. You sit there. You don't have to do any thinking except for I want that one. I just had a thought and it lost me, but it was like really important at the time. It was really important. Oh, you're talking about the booth. You're talking about customers. And it was something I wanted to say about. Well, you think about that. Um, the last couple of years, we were talking about customer experience and, and how we're, we're just always thinking about the customer experience. And I didn't realize that at the beginning, you know, but that's what I was thinking about. But then once I realized like, oh, this is all about the customer's experience, right? So like, how can we make this better? How can we make it immersive, right? So, you know, we were going to blow up the booth and do like a a big time booth there at the end. And I decided I would rather just retire, you know, at this point, um, you know, things are, things are changing in my life and I would rather go a different direction with my business and just retire this portion of my business. But all we were thinking about for the last two years was how do we make the customer's experience better than any anywhere they're ever going to go to? And then that is going to, just like it always has, 
that is going to get me bigger and better events. Like people ask me in equine photo school all the time. They say, Oli, how do we get events? How do we, you know, how do you get started? And getting started is like one thing and you need to go with your little network of, of friends or you need to start reaching out a little bit. But how you get bigger is by servicing the people you've already got at the best possible level you can, right? Like how do you make it better for your customers and your event producers? And how do you make, you know, how do you take care of everybody else? If you come into this at a mindset of just giving, giving, giving and making it better and better for everybody else, that will just come back to you in droves and waves and exponential growth. Yeah, I think word of mouth was huge. Okay, what I was gonna say was that there is a mindset shift too in your business that, again like photographers have this thing we see it a lot in wedding photographers where they're choosing photos because they're like emotional and they're thinking about the time like when they took that photo what was happening during the photo and like maybe that conversation that transpired and so they're including those pictures in a gallery because of like the emotions that their clients might have but your you what was happening in all these images was totally different these images were, these photos were uh, trinkets. Like that's how you would always explain them, that they were tokens or souvenirs from that weekend's event, from that, whatever like the producer was. So I'd always say like, we had to look at the weekend and be like, okay, well, there's like outside things that impact the way people buy photos too. Like, did they win? Did they rope with somebody like that they were related to or that they looked up to? Was the was the event good for them? Like, were the producers nice to them? Did it feel like a high end or luxury event that they want to remember? Like, oh, I roped there kind of thing. So like, these were always like souvenir pieces for people and not pieces of art. Like we weren't creating pieces of artwork in these photos. Like we were creating souvenirs for people. So when you make that shift in your mindset too, like that helped to, again, put the customers first, like put that experience first to think about like, okay, like how can we make this better for people too? So like the girls in the booth, like when I would train them, like always have fun and like jest with people too. Like if somebody roped bad or they like whatever, like it's okay to poke a little fun at them. Like, you know, kind of like feel, you know, play that field and see like where that's at, but make it an experience for them to, to like joke about things or comment on their horse or ask about where they're from or how their weekend went or whatever happened. Like we're always like approached this and like so many parts of your system just came down to a science like when we show pictures we sit like how we are now where we're facing the the tv the same way Mm -hmm. so it was a conversation about oh look at that picture or you know whatever like versus having our girls sit across the table and work it as a transaction like it wasn't a transaction it was more of like a friendly like look at your photos like let's have a conversation uh which which set the tone of the customer experience and your like sales process it set that tone from the very start so there's so much of your process that really went down to an exact science that when you look at it as a whole i I think now like hate to jump ahead Mm -hmm. but now you've started equine photo school where you kind of like teach or try to help other photographers get gigs or get to where you were like for us it's been kind of hard to be like here's how it works and like this is why it works so good but other people aren't seeing the intricacies or seeing the processes that you went through Mm -hmm. that we went through like at the end of it to to really change things uh to to be like, no, we've streamlined it. Like you have created a system that can scale from zero employees to 15 employees and the science behind why it works. It's so hard to get people to see those things, uh, to be like, yeah, it was, it was successful. Like you didn't retire because it wasn't successful (laughs) or it wasn't profitable. It's hugely profitable. (laughs) <laughs> like, so it's, it's so interesting to be on the inside of it. Uh, so like I could brag about your business all day, you know, to be on the inside of it and be like, these systems and processes, like, this is why they work. Like, mm-hmm. because they're tried, they're proven. You're know, like, what the last year, would we shoot like 30 events, 28 events, 20 mm, something. Yeah. Now. So it's like, we we're doing a lot of them. We're doing them for, you know, a, by the end of it, most of your events were like five days long. So it's like, we were doing Minimum, this yeah. a, a lot and every day. And he, like, this is how it, it kind of broke down. So I don't know, there's just so much that I think we could dive into, or that I could point out to be like, this is why the system worked. And this is why it was like so easy 
to train in new employees every weekend yeah. or to, you know, sell the, the photos we did. The last year you sold close to 17,000 photos. Uh, so, I mean, like that's, that's a lot of pictures. Those are just bought images, you know, yeah. like we've handled so much more data than that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's I shot about 400,000 pictures and sold 17,000. So it doesn't sound like I did very good, but um, the volume is there, right? Yeah. And just like Brenna was saying, you know, like putting people on the same side of the table is like you're literally and metaphorically on the same side. You know, like people don't feel like it's a confrontational, yeah. like mm-hmm. us versus them. It's like, let's look at these pictures together. Let me, you know, let me show you your pictures. Not, I didn't hire salespeople. I didn't want people... I told my people do not sell pictures, right? Show them their pictures. And it wasn't it. always rodeo school either. Like, right. Don't so- <laughs> train anybody on their, like, you know, you should have had your elbow up a little bit more. No, <laughs> no, listen. <laughs> yeah. So it was like finding the right is kind of people. Yeah. There's like so much work behind the backside of it to like finding the right employee. Mm-hmm. But then once it was like getting the person to show up that weekend, you know, like you were said before, like people who were flexible in their work schedules or that we could find at, at random places or whatever. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, the, the way that your business worked was there's so many little pieces, but when you look at it as a whole, it seemed like a production line, you know, yeah. like very it was very line. simple, like assembly line, like mm-hmm. this is how it works. Yeah, just hearing you guys talk, it feels like there was a lot of clarity and efficiency in the big picture. Like we know exactly what we're doing, but then here are the little details to actually make it get done and it seemed personal instead of like you said, like an assembly line because it was, but you put, you inserted the little like pieces that you needed to, to make it like, not just, uh, um, you know, like give us your money. You made it personal and like personality driven too, I guess, yeah. needed those components as well. You know, like a lot of a lot of people and other like fellow photographers, they look at what I was doing and they might take a, a picture that they saw on social media, right? And say, Well, I have a booth, you know, I have a crew, I've I've hired somebody, you know, I tried that once, it didn't work. Um, but I've tried it hundreds and hundreds of times with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And until, you know, like you, you just pluck out the bad stuff and you keep the good stuff as best you can and you lose some good people once in a while, uh, you know, but you're always trying to like improve it and better. And there's all these like the high level. Yeah, we all have booths, right? Like now a lot of people have booths. Now a lot of people like even print on site, right? And now a lot of people, you know, they have multiple employees now and they're starting to like get this trickle down, but they're not diving in deep enough to see like this little thing, right? Even like if Brenna was the customer and I was like a salesperson, right? And here we are looking at this TV here, I would have another person that's hired for me here and then a customer on the other side. So my people are together, the customers are separate because all these customers know each other and they wanna chit chat and have side conversations. That slows the booth process down, right? But if they separate them and you keep your people together so they can talk, they can collaborate, they can help. If you got somebody new, the, the more experienced person can show them how, you know, help them over a little circumstance without having to stop and get up and go walk around and find Brenna or find me. They can just do that and get it done and move on and keep showing. And just, we're trying to just streamline the process, get customers in and out efficiently and effectively without making them feel rushed. Again, like yeah. weird little stuff that it's hard, it's hard, and it's hard for people to grasp what we've noticed in equine photo school. Um, yeah. I guess like what I've noticed helping you teach things is that it's hard for people to grasp that that makes a difference. Yeah. Like it's hard for people to understand, like, no, having your employees together versus your customers together <laughs> makes a difference. Right. Or, um, you know, having people on the same side of the table makes a difference or where you sit in the arena, <laughs> like makes a difference. That's like huge. all of this stuff makes a difference whether it's a big difference or small difference but people aren't really grasping that like like you said they're like oh well i have tvs well they have you know 20 inch inch, tvs versus 50 inch tvs and it's like there's a there's a difference there or they're working on laptops versus uh, a tv system Mm -hmm. you know and it's like when people are looking at your 13 inch laptop screen they want to look at like what you're doing and how it's going they're not looking at themselves 
as like the main event or like mm-hmm. seeing the picture you know yeah. they're not seeing what's happening so just like small stuff that it's like it's hard to once you like have a system and you see how it works so well like it's kind of hard to like back it down to be like though these are the little pieces that add up to why it works so well and to get other people to like trust you on that and like take (laughs) to like take your word for it you know like I feel like you get that in a lot of different businesses too but Mm -hmm. and all of our all of the people who've been employees of all these images all all see that and they've all like mentioned at one point or another like this is a well-oiled machine and <laughs> right. it it all like just works so well. So um, it's been interesting to see it. Can you like scale back or think about advice that you would give somebody when they're, when they're trying to like nail down the system? Like if they're coming to a point of like hiring people, how can they simplify that system or how can they like lay it out for people to understand? I guess it really depends on the system they already have. Like I would start there and look at it and I would want to be there during a thing, not just talk about your system and not just, you know, conceptualize it, but watch it work, you know, watch it go in. A lot of times at all these images, especially at the beginning, uh, you know, like my mom would shoot for me sometimes, or I'd, I'd have a second shooter. And at the end, Brenna was shooting for me sometimes and I we would just swap out and I would go to the booth and I would just watch how it worked and kind of watch things or sit at the, you know, the main station, we'd trade places if there's not enough crew. Um, But it would just be a a matter of like, where are the hiccups? Like, where are the holdups? Um, Sometimes if you only have one viewing station, one salesperson, a customer could come in and take 30 minutes of your time or an hour of your time, chit chat, analyzing their run, you know, and they won't take the hint to leave. And you don't want to like force them out and be mean about it because like they don't understand uh, and so that will resonate back at you at some point, And that's bad news. So we were always trying to like be nice to people, but try to like, you know, come on. Mm-hmm. But the nice thing is if you have a second one, you know, you hired a second person, now you've got two. So if one gets bogged down, the other people waiting in line that are like, come on, buddy, get out of here. They say, well, I don't want to be that guy. And so they'll go in and out, in and out, in and out so fast. So that other one will make up for the difference. Now, if you have three or four or five of those, pretty soon people are in and out, in and out. Orders are just flowing in super fast. And so at some point, the the person that's managing your orders, it's printing, like they become the bottlenecks. So then you need a second booth or you need at least a second person, you know, helping you with orders. Like I've hired people that just take care of text message orders, like social media orders. Uh, That was their whole job the whole weekend uh, because we would give one, give one, quote unquote, give one to every customer, every contestant got one photo. Um, it was, it was sponsored and I, we still got paid for that, but I was able to hire somebody else, you know, put food on their table, help them, you know, through a tough time or whatever and say, Hey, if you'll just come here, you don't have to deal with customers or anything. I just need you to take these orders, process them for social and get them sent out. And it was just like clockwork, boom, 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 boom. That cut down so much on like your workload or whoever was run in my booth it was their workload and it just streamlined the process and there was almost nothing for me to do on monday you know and a lot of these photographers they they will stay up all night on the last day and then they are just getting up bright and early in the morning working on photos and working on orders all week long sometimes two weeks later they're still trying to get stuff done with me there's almost nothing i did custom collages still i didn't really turn that over anybody else but basically everything was needed to be done before everybody left yep i don't know if i answered your question or got <laughs> on a crazy tangent but sorry tangents are like the name of the game over here i feel like <laughs> yeah I, you, I think you guys explained it well but i wanted just to point out in case people didn't get it can you explain that you when you retired and what you're doing now because you guys talked about it but i want to make sure people know <laughs> what it is yeah it's your business you're retired i was okay like here's how i came into this business Oli had already been doing Oli's images for four years before we had met and then i was uh living in rapid city (laughs) the first year he came to rapid city he's like why don't you come help me sell photos i'm like i've got zero time for this like no time at all so again like it's a full year before he gets back around to some places so the next year he was back I was at the end of my contract at the tv station and so I was like okay well things are changing in my life like I can come 
do this now. So I did one event in Rapid City and then I got bribed with a trip to Glacier mm-hmm. National Park to go for the second uh the second event that I did with you. And then the third event was back in Spearfish. So it all kind of like worked out really well. And then at that point, I think I got primed up to to be like, okay, well, you, we traveled well together. Like, how about you come to the next one? And then, and then it was like, well, I'm going to Texas. You might as well ride along, um, kind of thing, which turned into three years with travel with all these images. Yeah, which three you, years. You riding along is way cheaper than me getting a plane ticket. Yeah. And so it was beneficial for me. Um, and you're a good employee. Yeah. You know, you jumped right in and you took care of stuff and you were able to come up with some things to help streamline. Yeah. The By the process. way, Oli's mom on that first day, she did not show up at noon. She showed up at six and yeah. the roping was like, there was like two people left in the roping that day. So I did the full day was like, trial by fire like here you it go was a light day we got done at six. it was a light day but it was <laughs> it was very much like here just like do it yeah. um so yeah it worked That's out fun. like I said like it just it seemed to fit and I was at the end of my contract there so then well, I started traveling with you and mm-hmm. then like just things evolved right so then it was three years three and a half years with yeah. all these yeah. images um so we when we were at all these images, we were living in a fifth wheel. We were traveling on average. We would move about every three days, um, whether it was like to the next event or just like to get on the road, to get down to the next event. Cause sometimes they were 20 hours apart. Sometimes they were four hours apart, uh, you know, traveling distance. So that's like a little bit about our life when we, when we did all these images. So just to like preface with that kind of stuff, like that's, we didn't have a home base. We didn't like yeah we didn't I sold everything, everything didn't was in the trailer like all the camera gear the booth set up like us living even and then when we hired employees for the weekend they would stay with us most so yeah most of the time like they would stay with us so um the like the garage portion of the travel the travel trailer yeah had queen bunk beds that people would stay with us and they had their own bathroom so like there was well it was a to clarify it was a fifth wheel toy hauler yeah uh, it had two full bathrooms and it slept eight or yeah. something. I was going like to say, so like a few events, we did have it full, like seven to nine people. Yeah. Like we in Vegas, when I had like nine or 10 of us That's packed in that trailer. So on the floor. Yeah. But those weren't all my employees. I didn't make my employees sleep on the floor. <laughs> but like, that's what our <laughs> life looked like. Just to like give some context to how, how the traveling worked too, like, and how to travel with all that gear and how to whatever, like. Mm-hmm. there was at one point we had what four IMAX in the trailer like all yeah. set up like we live in a in a fifth wheel and we have four IMAX like you know inches too. so it was very and we like we would always stay at like arenas or Walmart parking lots friends. or yeah friends places like it a few like rare times when we didn't have an event we would go stay at a campground or like an RV resort kind of thing but yeah. uh, most of the time we were just like traveling we were like pretty heavy driving almost every day so I had so much camera gear in there that I actually broke the suspension <laughs> on my triple axle fifth wheel yeah so it was pretty intense I feel like you guys, I don't know if you have footage, but in hindsight, you should have had like a documentary. Like, yeah, we did. Time. there was like so many times, like, we should have a vlog. And then yeah. I'm like, oh, that takes so much time. Oh, like, there's no way there's time for a vlog. <laughs> so, like, I just I write like a TV not. show someday based yeah. on your life. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of times when I thought about hiring like a freelance videographer, you know, to just follow us around and just do it, you know, because like there was the expendable income to have that. And I think it would have helped a lot of things yeah. and it'd be good footage for me to use for equine photo school now. Uh, but I just like finding somebody that had that kind of coverage that wanted to go with us is like, it's like trying to find another Brenna, you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. that's hard work. I went through a ton of people that managed my booth before uh, Brenna came along and started. And even then, you know, transitioned over, it took a couple of events to kind of make that transition happen. Uh, you know, because I had good friends that were doing that and I was flying them in. I was, you know, doing whatever it took to make that happen, to get my crew there. And they were doing a good job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It wasn't like they, they were bad or whatever, but, you know, when you have consistent help from week to week to week to week, yeah you can do higher level tasks, right? Like Brenna was uploading to my website. And before that, I was having to do that the next day, like on Monday or whatever. And so getting that instant gratification, you know, a little bit closer to instant gratification, we made more money. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, talk about retirement. Why did you retire? What are we doing now? I, a lot of reasons why I retired, but like, <laughs> just was done, you know, just like, uh, income was great. Like I, my income was growing year after year after year. I was not seeing a dip when COVID happened. I saw a spike. That was great. Like I made more money during COVID and a lot of people lost their jobs and I feel bad for them. Uh, but it was great for me. It worked out good in my favor. Mm-hmm. A lot of events came to where I was already at. I was, instead of traveling to them, they traveled to where I was already like camped out at the lazy eat, you know, like they were going there uh, because they didn't have a lockdown and other places like Reno and Vegas, they had lockdowns. So they were coming to us. Um, The nice thing. So that cut down on travel expenses and everybody was excited to be at a different Mm -hmm. location for that event. So that bolstered sales, whatever. So we had a good year, really, really good year. And you know, could have kept it going. I think if I would have kept going, it would have just made more and more money. I, you know, I didn't see that there, that there was like, um, that I was diving into a hole or whatever. It wasn't going down. It was going up quite drastically, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, I'm money motivated. And when there's a huge chunk of money, that's not huge, huge, right? Like in like, I'm not Donald Trump over here, but, um, if there's like, you know, you got a pocket of cash, I don't feel like working. Like I, I don't want to work to work, right? I want to work to make money. And when when that's no longer an issue, I'm like, okay, I feel like this is not the best use of my time. I don't want to sit in an arena. I don't want to eat concession food. I don't want to get fatter. Uh, You know, I've lost like 26 or seven pounds since we left, since we retired, like making stuff happen. I want to, this is my office now, you know, (laughs) I like this stays set up. I don't have to tear it down, set it up, tear down, set up every single day. You know, it was just like, this is a lot of work. It's really monotonous. And then there was a few people that made it miserable and just could not stand to work with them anymore. Very few customers, but a couple of producers just it was just awful. And they were, you know, some of my big, biggest money makers too. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't care how much money I make with you. I'm never working with you again. Yeah. And then I thought, why don't I just retire? And I could go to teaching because equine photo school is starting to ramp up. I was getting a lot of inquiries about what I was doing and trying to help people, but I didn't have time to make videos and courses and whatever. So I thought I'm going to retire. I'm just going to make videos and courses. I'm going to just hold on to my best clients. And then I found a couple new clients that have been awesome. Now I'm just going to work with a select few high level clients, really knock out of the park for them. One of them just texted me today, said, since I met you, my business has tripled. I was like, that's what, that's what I'm here for. Like, that's what I'm doing for you. You pay me well, you make even more money. Like, this is like a win-win. This is a good environment. If things go south with a client, I just say, buy, you know, I can fire them as a client and say, great. I just want to keep my, my Zen here. I just want to keep my, my internal, like, you know, mind, I positive, like fill it full of positivity. We got a pool now, you know, it was really hard to have a pool with an RV. I mean, life is just better all on every front. I think like, I'll speak a little bit too, because because like I was there during all of that. So just like from an outsider perspective or maybe things that like you don't go, always done this interview with multiple people before about like what I do and what I do now. Yeah. But you were really feeling like you, we talked about a lot, like you climbed to the top of the mountain, you're at the peak, you enjoyed the view. And then you're like, okay, it's time for the next mountain. Like you were, you were at the top. It, it sounds so Condescending. Yeah, I yeah. guess, but also like silly for a uh, such a niche niche market yeah. of being a horse and rodeo photographer, uh, you know, equine sports photographer. I guess but yeah. it's more, um, but really like being at that level, like you are shooting the biggest, the biggest gigs, the yeah. biggest events that were happening in um, you know, the Western U.S. Um, there was nothing else to strive for or like go after like yeah. you were shooting with the top of the gear like right. you know what I mean there was no camera bodies that were new yeah. that like it you had reached the end of of the leveling up kind of like process mm-hmm. yeah and so you really got to a point where you were just like 
okay, what do we do? And and then, yeah, the pandemic happened and they, it was a great year for us. But I, when we got to not work and we got to like focus on ourselves or try different avenues of things, you know, that's when Western Wedding Magazine happened for me. Equine Photo School really got a lot of time yeah. and focus. And then it got to be like, we don't have to sit in arena every mm-hmm. weekend. Like we could do other things that are are making money that are doing different things and like living life on our terms uh versus like how long is this roping going to go today or mm-hmm. whatever so it was august of 2020 that you kind of made the decision like i want to retire yeah. full out i don't want to do this anymore like end 34. Of the, yeah it's, <laughs> you turned 34 like, the <laughs> end of the year came and you're like i kind of want to just be done and then um we shot, we shot an event in the end of September. So about mm-hmm. a month later where we shot for, what was it? 40 hours, close to 40 hours straight where yeah. we had like rotated back and forth, um, but shot for, for 40 hours, that mm-hmm. rope and just went on. And I was like, this, it just <laughs> sucks. Like this isn't fun for anybody. Like no. we don't sleep, we don't eat well, we don't do yeah. any of it. Like it wasn't a great lifestyle. Um, outside of like you know people ask too like well don't you miss it don't you whatever and it's like you know we miss um we miss like the friends we made you know the people you would get to see once a year the producers that we worked with like there were some producers who I would call really close friends and really great people um but those yeah those few that made it just miserable and like unenjoyable to even be in the industry as a whole is really what it felt like sometimes it was like why why do we even want to be in this industry um they just kind of like made it made it not fun to like be there at all and so yeah it was just kind of like is this you know a point of being like is this what I want to do for the next five years you know you kind of reevaluate those things all the time and look at your business look at your life and be like okay is this going the way I thought it would go is it whatever so yeah like I, when I first started traveling with you, I wanted to have a tiny house on wheels. Like that was my thing. Always like, I live in a fifth wheel and I'm like, no way. Uh, you know, it's like so much in life, I think had just like evolved and changed. And then it was like, all right, my, my business was growing. I was doing magazine. All these images was wicked busy. Like, you know, like I said, we were shooting these events that were five days long. And then we got to a point where we were working with a handful, I would say, of the same producers. So like all these calf robings we'd go to was like the same clients. Like I was making relationships with all these people. Like we were seeing them, you know, more and more often. And it was like, everything was just growing and getting bigger. And it just kind of came to a point where it was like, okay, what, what falls, what, gets like lifted up where we at in that point so I think that's a lot of that went into Mm -hmm. deciding to retire like it wasn't it wasn't bad like yeah the job wasn't bad the money wasn't bad it was just like what does our life look like yeah like the you know like we miss some of the clients and customers but they miss us too like I even last week I'm been retired for a year and two months people are still like when are you coming back to texas to shoot some pictures like, i'm not <laughs> like get it too bad, right like i am not ever coming back yeah. um there was a point you know a, little, a couple months last year where i was like man i missed the income that was nice to have you know as like my retirement fund is like you know going the wrong direction uh but now not now you know now i feel like i don't even miss the income because like yeah. i've replaced it and then some and i feel mm-hmm you know, like everything is better. I'm working way less, like, you know, here in a couple months, we're going to have pool time again. Cause we <laughs> haven't got a heated pool yet, but you know, just like any of that, if we want to take a break in the middle of doing something, I just, I can get up. Like one of the things that I could never do was go to the go bathroom, to bathroom whenever I wanted to. So <laughs> oh now God. I feel like you had to wait for a drag or I had to call Brenna and say, can you come shoot for me? And she'd say, well, I'm swamped at the booth, but if you need me to, I guess. And I'm like, well, I, you know, like, I don't want to hold up the booth. Uh, so I just have to, you know, kind of hang out, wait it out. So, you know, you don't drink a lot of liquids throughout the day. So like, it's just not a real healthy lifestyle the way I was doing it. I'm sure there's somebody out there. Yeah. That, got you know, it figured out. Figure that part out better than I did. Um, you know, they bring their own sandwiches. I don't know, whatever, but um for me you know it was like I had my yeti cooler that was given to me from the bfi um and that was like half of that was camera gear and half of it was like food and drinks 
but still like it's just like a miserable time yeah you know sitting there endlessly we were listening to a comedian last night and she's <laughs> like I just I didn't know it hurt so bad to sit all day because I work at home like yeah sister listen you got a nice chair at home you know let me talk about sitting all day <laughs> you know like yeah, uh, yeah everything like even like the chair that I sat in evolved so much yeah out time like uh I started on this little step stool I still have it this little step stool I, I sit on out here that collapses I sat on that for a while and then it was like well my I need like a backrest you know because my back hurts and I can't sit up like this all day and and then so I put a backrest on it I was like I modified this I changed out chairs it was like trying new things all the time it was just like what can we pluck out of here and put in maybe something better yeah yeah. yeah, it was kind of like crazy to see it evolve. I think that's a testament too to like your business. If you if you have systems and processes that are easy for you and easy for your customers and create great client experiences, they're going to follow you no matter what you do. So, you know, now that you're not shooting events, you're still a photographer. You yeah. still do that, but you also do creative work too. So like all these clients have followed him from like, oh, I used to buy pictures from you at the team rope in to, oh, I have a stallion. Can you actually come to our place, do our pictures, do our ads, do our marketing? So like, it's all evolved. And like, we've you know, retained, I've retained clients from the old images days too, where it's like, I met them out of team roping, but then I ended up doing their branding or their website and now they're retainer clients. So it's like, we've kept a lot of those people just because of the experience that you're able to give people, um, which I think says a lot about your, your business as well. But I guess like my, what I'm trying to get to is like my advice for people, if you're at that pinnacle of being like, do I just throw it all away. Like that's how a lot of people could have looked at what you did. You know, yeah. like you built up this business of seven years and you're like, you just threw it all away. Like why? Like, so then I think a lot of people are like, well, the money couldn't have been good or it couldn't have been like yeah. working because you decided to retire. But like, that wasn't it at all. Like right. it was a, it was a, a leap of faith. Uh, not really a leap of faith, but just trusting the process that like people will follow you. If people value your work and your work is good, which it obviously is, uh, then your customers are always going to, they're always can, like, that's going to come out on top. You know what I mean? No matter what other people have to say about your decision to leave your business or to retire, like Oli did, mm -hmm. like it's your customers are going to come out on top. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like all the hard work you put in for so many years, like I was obviously meant to be because it brought you here and you, you could leave and still be okay. Like you're obviously, you know. Yeah. And I think you outgrow things too. Like it was time. Obviously it was something you had to decide to do. And I feel like that's a lot of entrepreneurial stories. There's pivotal points and you make change. And that's, I mean, it's kind of cool to see that yeah. from the outside, I guess. Yeah, like I didn't have an exit strategy from the beginning, you know, I probably should have, uh, but I never, I was never the guy that was like, I love this. I love taking pictures yeah. of horses, you know, like I, I've been around the horse and rodeo thing since I was born. Uh, like my parents have got the, the, their place and the newspaper and whatever. And so like, I've always been in that environment, you know, I've always been around all these people and I knew that I wasn't gonna be able to do this for very long because, you know, a lot of them kind of you know, I don't really jive with, I guess, but so it was never like, Hey, I want to, I want to be a horse photographer. I want to be this kind of photographer. I, it was always like, this is a great way for me to make enough money and justify having all this great camera gear so I can go and do something fun with it. You know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. we all the time, like one of the reasons we moved here to Arizona is because the desert is like 10 minutes away and we just drive out there and we can go shoot pictures of whatever we want to all the time and catch sunset every other day if we wanted to or whatever so it's just one of those things like justifying having all that great gear and yeah like I had a hundred thousand dollars in camera gear plus you know 150 or whatever yeah. I don't know what it was um but having that and now I still have a lot of that and I can go and create anything I want now you know what I mean I have all the best tools the photography has to offer and I just go and I can create something for fun if I want. And it's more enjoyable because I have the good stuff that's easy to use. Well, it was easy to transition to what you do now. Like yeah. now a lot of what you do is a lot of video marketing for one of your clients. Like yeah. 
having the photography gear that was at that level. And then you bought video gear uh, for one event that you had done, right? So it's yeah. like that event paid for this video gear that now has led you transition into doing this video marketing for a client. Like, right. yeah, all of it, your mindset on that too, like which I've tried to adapt is like when you buy stuff, it always has to make money. Like yeah. it's always like a money maker. Um, not just like, faster. yeah, not just like, oh, I want the newest camera body because it came out. It's right. like, no, can it, can it make you money? Can you right. book a gig that's going to pay for that to justify like up leveling or whatever it may be. So exactly. that's like, talk about scaling a business fast. Yeah. I think that's really helped you do that. Right. I mean, people talk about like, you see these one DXs back here and they're like, five what did I say I bought them in 2017 so we're like five years old now mm -hmm. and people are like yeah there's seven thousand dollars how did you buy that or whatever like who seven thousand dollars I over you know I'm making three hundred thousand dollars a year with those things like what is seven grand yeah. it's, you know who cares I wish it was fourteen thousand dollars for those things you know what I mean like it, it wouldn't matter still just like Brandon was saying like this light here and that light there like this mic like all of this stuff was paid for you know, because somebody hired me, they said, can you do video? I said, yes, I can. Here's my price. I, you know, I went and searched all the gear I needed to do the job. I said, it's going to cost me this much. I doubled that. And I said, this is how much I need to shoot this thing. So they paid for all the gear. Plus I made all that money and now I'm still using it every day. You know, I'm using it to make more money indefinitely. I want to talk about that point really quick. This is like <laughs> the end of our conversation and like just to talk about like business tips or whatever. But when you said that, like you looked at what your gear would cost before you like booked the gig. Yeah. Um, there was also like an, an instance or has been instances where like if somebody wants to like barter your cost, right? Like, I don't know that we've talked about this before, but I think we should on our podcast about like staying firm to your prices and what you're offering in your businesses. But um, you've had people that are like, oh, I can't afford that. So you either like take off services from the package or with all the gear, you've been able to be like, okay, well, I'll just rent you the gear or look at what that rental cost would be like. Yeah. And then you can like pay that cost. And then when they see that, they're like, oh, yeah. I actually don't know how to use any of that. So I guess I am going to pay you for your time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, <laughs> they really just like whatever. So um, looking at the cost of the gear that goes into whatever service you're offering, I think that's like a really good business tip. Yeah. I mean, I remember the first time that somebody wanted to, you know, negotiate my prices and my prices were not out of line. Like they were too low in Way fact. Too low. And I was just like, hey, I'm already here. Like, yeah, I'll only do it for this much. Like whatever. I just kind of threw them a, a thing and I, it was just going to be Brenna or somebody at the booth to just go and do something that, you know, didn't, didn't last all day. Right. It was a short period of time. So I shot them a, a price that I thought was more than fair and they scoffed and they laughed at me and they were like, no way. And I was like, well, or you can just rent the gear for me and you can hire one of your people to shoot it. And she's like, yep, let's do that. So I went on borrow lenses or whatever, you know, rental site, figured out how much the minimum cost was going to be to rent all this stuff price it out for them i'm sure i forgot a few things but hey whatever you forgot insurance i remember oh, yeah. that i forgot gear insurance because i i had my own gear insurance that i pay for that i suggest everybody make sure you're insured uh but so i i forgot some stuff but basically i gave him this number and i said here here it is and it was only like 200 bucks less yeah. than what i was just gonna charge him for and they were like oh okay well we'll do that we'll save some money so i said I was shooting pictures, you know, so I'm trying to do this in between runs. And so I said, Brenna, box up all that gear. It's, a, it's already in the trailer. Just grab it. Make sure it's just, you know, it's all there. Box it up, grab it, um, drop it off at them and just go back to the booth and get back to, you know, selling pictures in the system. And it wasn't like five minutes later, they said, well, aren't you going to set this up for us? I said, no, that if you rented it from a rental yeah. house, they would ship, ship it to it. you in a box. So here it is in the boxes it came in, you know, everything comes in a box. So I was like, if you, you know, if you want us to set it up for you, it's going to be $500 to set it up, you know? So that was going to be more because like by the time we screwed around and set it up, we could have had the dang yeah. thing done already. You know, uh, you should have hired us from the beginning. So then they're like, all right, well, I guess we'll just go back to your original if that still stands. And so then we just shot it for them and set it up and did it. Yeah. And you know, the whole thing. So I'm like, well, 
really like we weren't charging you that much you know if you realize how much this gear costs to rent and and the whole thing if, if you're factoring all that in i only profit yeah. a couple hundred bucks right you know, like, who cares? and yeah i really at that point it's like is that even like a profit at all like your right. time your time is worth a lot of money that's a, a big thing in all these images too like yeah. why speed and like efficiency is a big deal is because like our time is all money and it all like you know, takes money um, to do it mm -hmm. and your expertise, you know, whether it was hiring people just for the weekend and like them knowing, cause there was like a fine line of like, this isn't always rodeo school to like knowing <laughs> what's happening. And like, that's a horse, that's a, a <laughs> rider. Like, what do yeah. we, what do we call people? What do we like, you know, don't say I like your cute outfit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or like calves versus steers, like the yeah. whole thing, it, it all means something. Yeah. Um, so there's a fine line of hiring people who like understand the sport to people who want to like critique the sport like know too much about it mm -hmm. so you, know, too much you know like all of it too like finding that person whether it's for the weekend or to be there for the time like they need a little bit of knowledge or education in what's happening as well so all of that costs money right and it all comes at a certain price so um yeah I think that's like a lot there's been a lot of stuff I've implemented in my business that I've learned from you and what you have in all these images and like how you've ran a tight ship because, because I've seen it be profitable and I've seen all of the like behind yeah. the scenes that it took to get to that point that it's kind of like, mm -hmm. I feel like a little bit too, where I'm like, okay, well, I've seen all that, <laughs> all that part. Like, I don't have to try that out my own business. I can just like plop it right into like my business model and what I've got going on. Yeah. So you want to talk about making a cut? I feel like we've the line. talked a lot today. We're an hour and a half into this podcast. And? <laughs> I feel like That's there's fine. so much. Um, so like the basis of how we were stacking our episodes this uh, season, if anybody hasn't picked up on it, I think we talked about it before, is like walking people through the business journey of, you know, we talked about the mindset and starting your business. Um, we, we've touched on like systems and processes and how they're kind of evolving. That's what we talked about in our last episode too. And like how people's systems and processes, like everything that Oli talked about here today is obviously for a photography business, but that doesn't mean it will fit your wedding photography business. Like this was mm -hmm. high volume action photography. Like like it, everything, you know, some of it transfers, some of it doesn't. So being able to pick apart people's businesses and see where that fits into your business. So mm -hmm. maybe later on, we'll have to have you on the podcast and talk about the monetary side of things and like yeah. really figuring out those things. Cause I think you have a lot to say on that as well. Well, in the wedding photographers, they, they don't talk about having a booth, but they talk about IPS yeah. in-person sales. A lot of those things transfer over. A lot of it's the same kind of deal. You know, you're working with one client for a period of time instead of having, you know, turnover. But but basically, you know, you're still there. You're still selling stuff. You're bringing stuff in. You're showing them at the booth at all these images. You know, we had displays up. Every you know, every photographer has their little displays. My displays to stop people in their tracks and say, "I want that." You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? And that's what you got to do as a wedding photographer. You bring them in, show them. You show them a book, you yeah, show them an whatever, an album, yeah, or you show them canvases, you show them, you know, metal prints or whatever it might be. And th th when they can touch it and hold it and feel it, that's when they're like, yeah, you know, yeah. because they can't, they can't conceptualize it like we can, you know, being so familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's today's episode was really to talk about your processes and how you built them and what your systems look like. And I think really to focus on like why they're important or to like see like like I said earlier there were so many pieces of all these images where it's like okay it was like a broad scale but then inside of each part was like a system and a process for each step of the way um so how you built that I think is is interesting and it's fun to hear you talk about yeah thanks yeah, yeah. What, where can people find you or check in with you keep up with you so my main my main website is oliesimages.com. It's O L I E S images. Um, there from there you can find equinephotoschool.com. There's direct links to that. Um, anywhere on social media, either search Oli's images or Equine Photo School. Uh, that's it. I mean, it's simple. I got those two. That's my main my main stuff. So if you want to, you know, hire me as a photographer, Oli's images. If you want to learn how to do photography and stuff, that's Equine Photo School. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. I really thanks. enjoyed the conversation. And like, yeah, you can come back anytime and talk to us about all the other parts of business too. <laughs>
Well, that's it for this episode of the Rural Rundown podcast. Thanks for listening. You can always find us on social media at the Rural Rundown. And if you really liked this episode, we would totally love it if you gave us a review and gave us a little rating. It would mean so much to us. And for more small town roots and business savvy, catch us on the next one.